Duck Society. <laughs> <laughs> It's always fun catching up with Patrick Grove. The early disruptor showed us his offices in Kuala Lumpur, complete with recreational games, a punching bag, even a secret back door to his private office. It's like a vault. Like a vault. Come on in. At 42, he's a dot-com survivor, a comeback kid who has made his millions from internet startups putting him on Malaysia's rich list. It's, more, it's, the most it's been a tremendous ride. I mean, I've been an internet entrepreneur since I was probably 24 years old. It's been such, such a journey. I first met him in the year 2000. A lot of dot-coms fail every year. What happens if Catcher doesn't make it? What would you do then? Wow, that, that's, that's a really tough question. That's something that I've actually never, ever considered. Um, if Catcher did make it, I think what I would do is I would I would move straight into trying to start up another internet startup. I mean, the internet is something that I believe so strongly in. And if Catcher uh, in itself was to fail, I think I'd move straight into starting another internet startup. Catcher nearly did go under during the dot com crash. But Grove pulled through, taking five companies from startup to IPO. This floor is new. Today, the seasoned entrepreneur is no less ambitious, with big plans for video on demand service iFlix and other startups like iCar and Rev Asia. People don't realize that, you know, this whole excitement around tech companies in Southeast Asia is really only a three to four year old phenomenon, whereas we've been doing this, you know, since 1999, so that's some 17 years. You know, what we've seen in the last three years in terms of innovation, in terms of funding, in terms of usage and everything growing mm -hmm. is greater in the last three years than the preceding 14 years. Okay. iFlix just closed a new VC funding round worth 133 million US dollars, bringing in a total of 220 million just this year alone. A big pivot, Grove says, has been in the funding scene. What I find fascinating is that when we IPO'd those companies, you know, it wasn't because we were experts at IPOing or anything like that. It was because there was a serious shortage of funding in Southeast Asia. Look at the mm. first company that we IPOed, which was iProperty in the year 2007. I mean, that's like 10, 11 years ago now. Mm. It's only in the last three to four years that VC funding in this part of the world has exploded. The so IPO your options have opened mm. up? Correct, they've completely opened up. And if you look at some of the great you know, tech companies in Southeast Asia today, like Grab and Garena, or like iFlix, you know, they've, they've all raised so much money privately because there's so much opportunity out there in terms of investors who love Southeast Asia and are willing to back great entrepreneurs and great management teams. So you don't have to IPO on day one. Well, since the last two years since I spoke to you, you've actually sold iProperty Group to Rupert Murdoch's REA Group for 534 million US dollars. It was the largest exit in ASEAN history. Was it a dream come true? What were some of the emotions you were going through at that I, time? I, Do you I, remember? You no, know, I, remember, I remember completely. And I mean, it, it, was, it was so important on so many levels. One is that I'd always been a huge fan of Rupert Murdoch and, and how, how from such a young boy in a small city in Australia, he had built one of the largest media conglomerates in the, in the world. So he'd, he'd, and, and everything that he'd done, he'd been very disruptive in how he challenged the newspaper industry and how he challenged the TV industry and how he challenged the cable industry. And since that moment, I have many entrepreneurs and investors come up to me and almost say, hey, you know, thank you. This was really good for the scene because it really proved that somebody, and it doesn't have to be me, but, but it could be somebody could build a great internet company in Southeast Asia and generate a great return mm -hmm. for the investors. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so many times today when I see investor presentations from young startups and they always think, oh, what will happen to my company one day? There's always an example of iProperty saying, hey, if iProperty was sold for this amount, my company can be sold for more even later You're one day. You happy with the price tag? And look, I think it was, it was the right transaction for the buyer. It was the right transaction for us as the sellers. Was it your dream come true? I mean, the exit is, it was never the dream come true. I mean, did you, was, have, did you find it hard to let your baby go? Very, very hard, you know, because we had worked in that company for 10 years, you know, and, and we almost treat every company in the catch-up portfolio, it's, it's, it's like a family-run business. And so when you have to sell a business and you're no longer involved with them on a day-to-day -day basis, of course, it's, 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 it's a bit of a culture shock. Well, since then, you're working on another big, hairy, audacious goal, mm. a, a term you've coined since the last time I met you. You're now building up iFix, a video streaming business. 
you want to be the Netflix of emerging markets? Is that your goal? No, not not at all. I think I think I mean, if if anything, I think we you know we really want to revolutionize internet TV in emerging markets. I think what Netflix is doing is absolutely great and phenomenal. But you know, they're only one. But it started small out the fact that you tried to copy them in the first place, right? <clears throat> then you've kind of readjusted your business model. Is that it? I think I think what's interesting is that if you say the business model of showing videos on the internet is their business model, mm -hmm. then that's what we copied. Mm -hmm. And, and it also means that you know we were inspired by YouTube, we were inspired by Hulu, we were inspired by Facebook Video, mm. and I think one of the th great things that we want to do, as we look going forward over the next ten years, that we realize that in the emerging markets globally, you know, there's a massive transformation in the industry where, you know, you have linear TV, mm -hmm. which is what we all are familiar with. Hey, you know, rush home on a Thursday night to watch my favorite show at 8 p.m., and that's an industry that billions and billions mm. and billions of dollars of value has been built around. But when you look at what is happening on the ground in Indonesia, in Saudi Arabia, you know, in Morocco, is no one's rushing home at 8 p.m. to watch their favorite show. Mm. Everybody is watching what they want to watch on demand, and more often than not, on a mobile phone, as opposed to a flat screen TV in a living room. There needs to be a new delivery mechanism, there needs to be a new distribution partner, and there needs, there needs to be a new brand that delivers all of that to the consumer. And that's exactly what iFlix is trying mm. to do. So where do you get your video content from? Who are you working with? <clears throat> um, well, we're not working with Managing Asia yet, but we'd love to <laughs> one day. Um, but you know, we work with over 200 studios and production companies globally. So you know, every market, let's use Indonesia as an example, mm. 50% of our content would come from local studios and local providers. So we're talking about local content. Hardcore local content, very, very Unlike local. Unlike Netflix, which relies on Hollywood. Correct, correct. So I mean, you know, we think they're a great Western service, but if you, if you go deep into the emerging markets like Indonesia, like Philippines, like Thailand, you know, 50 to 80% of what the viewers want to watch is local content, mm. local stories, local talent, local creators, local language. And that's this huge void that iFlix is trying to fill. You know, we're making local content in local markets. So for instance, you know, we've taken a very popular movie in Indonesia and we've now turned that into a very popular TV series that we will launch in the next couple of months. Mm, what do you know about making video content? What do I know about making video <laughs> content? You're an internet entrepreneur. I'm an internet entrepreneur, but you know what's, you know what's really funny is that because we come from an internet world, we think about it so differently okay. that we believe works in the world. So for instance, when we make video or when we license video, we study data religiously. We said, let's not look at TV data. Let's not look at any of the ratings data that ad agencies traditionally use. You know what we looked at? We looked at piracy data in every market. Mm -hmm. So we believe our number one competitor is not linear TV. We believe our number one competitor is digital and physical piracy. So what we would do is that we would go to pirated DVD shops, <laughs> you which, which is a little bit risky, <laughs> and we'd, we'd, I wouldn't go, but I'd send teams <laughs> to buy the, the top 20 pirated DVDs in every market. And then we'd go to the ISPs and say, can we look at your streaming data? Can we look at your BitTorrent data? Mm. And from that, we'd get a data set. So we would know, for instance, I'll give you an example. We launched in Saudi Arabia mm. a couple of weeks ago. About four months ago, we had teams go study all the digital and physical piracy data. So then we came up with a huge hit list of the top 1,000 oh, shows in Saudi watching. Arabia based on piracy. And we believe that data is far better than any other way of measuring what are the top shows You're talking people about like to legit watch. video, right? Correct. <laughs> correct. Correct. So what are the top professionally produced video that people are watching? Okay. So you recently completed your latest round of funding, taking the total amount raised to more than 300 million US dollars. What exactly is the cash burn rate and how much more do you need mm. to fully roll out iFlix in all the markets that you want to be in? Yeah. So look, that's a very interesting question. And you know, when we think of cash burn, we never really think of it as burn. We think of it as how much money do you need to invest mm. to get as much market share? You don't think of it as possible. burn rate? We, we don't think of it as, as burn. And, you know, and, 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 and here's why, right? When you look at, you've got to understand when you're building internet companies that have the ability to scale so incredibly rapidly, you think from a different lens than the way traditional industry was built. So when we look at a business that we build from day one, Christine, we assume that it's a five to seven year journey mm -hmm. in terms of investment before you start to get and What sort of profits. amount are you looking at for that five to seven years? Look, if we want to disrupt the way that a billion people in emerging markets are entertained over the next five to seven years, this is probably going to cost us anywhere from three to five hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. So you're almost there? <clears throat> we think we're almost there. Um, there's a long way ahead of us in terms of execution. There's a lot more markets to be launched, but in terms of 
are we happy with what we've done in the first two years? Completely. Okay. So do you remember the first time you started raising money for iFlex? That was way back in 2015. Yeah. How many pitches did you have to do before finally someone said yes? Y you know, you know. Did you count? We, we did. We did. We did <laughs> count. And you know what's fascinating, Christine, is that fundraising is one of those things that's it's such a crucial thing mm. to building a great disruptive internet Have company. Have you got and, it down to a and, science? And, and no, I, I, don't, I don't think we ever will, but I think it's just, we work goddamn hard. We try to work with the smartest people out there we can find. You never took no for and, an answer. And, and I think that's what it is. It's, yeah. it's you know, I, I once read a really great saying that said, no never means no, it just means not now. So it could mean yes tomorrow or yes next week. It just means at this particular point in time, my no is a no. But ask me again tomorrow. Ask me again next week. Mm -hmm. And I think for iFlix, to raise our first round of funding, I think it was about 124 meetings before we finally got a yes. 124. You actually yeah. counted. Oh, we got the first yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I, ca I, I count it with pride. It's like a badge of honor. <laughs> the number of people that say no is is almost what motivates us to keep pushing. It's the people who didn't believe in it. The people who said, "You'll never make it. Your business model will never work. You'll never get revenue. You'll never get content. That keeps you going. You'll never get technology." And and in this really perverse way, I think we've conditioned ourselves to make that the greatest motivator. And the motivators, when someone says you can't do it, there's something inside us that wants to prove them wrong. that we can. Well, the okay. video market is huge, but there are lots of competitors. You have the heavyweight Netflix, mm. you have PCCW's View, Sony, Singtel, mm. Hook. Yeah. What's your battle plan? Number one, we're launching in all the key emerging markets as fast as possible. It's a land grab. Speed. It's speed. I, I give you some markets ex examples. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Sudan, uh, Myanmar, all markets that we launched um, in the last two, three weeks. And these are markets prior to our launching. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any video internet service at all. Number two, we've got to have the best technology. No doubt about it. If you study every great technology company in the world, all the names that you've mentioned. You know, you look at all the great names in China, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. What, what makes them stand out at the end of the day? It's their commitment and their investment in technology and building the best platform out there. So when you think about, you know, where do we invest our money? Where do we invest our time? You know, like, you know, what am I, when I'm lying in bed stressed about something about iFlix, which is many nights, <laughs> More than not, it's technology. Yeah. Is our technology faster than everyone else? Is our technology, you know, letting you find the content better than everyone else? So it's winning that technology battle. And number three, and most importantly, particularly in video, it's content. We got to have the best content. Sure. We got to give the users the content that they want. Do you ever worry about when you're going to make money? You know, it's it's not so much worrying about that. It's yeah. more that when you, when you think about building great disruptive internet businesses, it's really about sequencing what wars and what battles to focus on. Geographical, you know, expansion, having the best technology out there, having the best data and analytics to determine what content users want to watch. And if I think about those three things over the next three to four years and win in all three of those categories, Christine, this will be a very, very profitable business in years five, six and onwards. Mm. So in terms of profitability, I mean, we're definitely focused on profitability. But the ironic thing is the focus on profitability is to say, let's focus on winning these three things first. And, and the, the money will come later. And the money will come in phase two of this business. More with internet entrepreneur Patrick Grove in just a moment. I think funding is definitely getting harder. Um, you know, for our last round of funding, I had to travel the globe <laughs> like four times within five weeks. Managing Asia, we'll be right back. We were very worried that we were too young and that no one would take us seriously. And I remember for the first couple of months we used to wear suits to work every day with ties and jackets. And I think after a while as the business started to grow and as, as, as we started to see the success of the business and the recognition of the business, I think it more came to the case that it was actually a benefit that we were younger. This week on Managing Asia, I'm in Kuala Lumpur to catch up with an early mover in Asia's internet boom, Patrick Grove. So Patrick, whether it's a taxi app, e-commerce or video streaming, a lot of successful internet startups here in Asia essentially copy models from mm. the West. Is that starting to change here in Asia? Is Asia now churning out great successful internet ideas? Yep. So Christine, I think it's a great question. And what we've seen is that, you know, for the first 15 years of the internet and all the great internet companies that were created, the innovation 
came from the West, came from Silicon Valley, and then entrepreneurs in Asia, in China, would just basically cut and paste those ideas. And I was one of the entrepreneurs that did that. Mm. And, but what I've seen in China in the last two years completely blown me away. China is out innovating the West. So when you look at the great internet business models going forward, and where people like me look for inspiration, it's less and less the US, and it's more and more China. And I'll give you one example, which, which anyone will know. If you've used WhatsApp and you've used WeChat, mm -hmm. you see a humongous difference between what those two apps do for you. And one for me is symbolic of the West and one is symbolic of the East. So China's leading Asia. Is, is completely in terms leading of Asia. Ideas. So when we look for ideas now, you know, we look to China. I'm actually going to China in three weeks for one week uh, with my co-founder Mark with the sole aim of just looking for ideas. Whereas we would never go to Silicon Valley to look for ideas. We, we don't think that's where the great innovation is coming from. What I would love, love, love to see happen in the next five years is that Southeast Asia also becomes a hub of innovation. Is funding drying up? Are investors is, less willing now to part with their money? I think funding is definitely getting harder. Um, you know, for our last round of funding, I had to travel the globe <laughs> like four times mm -hmm. within five weeks. So that would be Singapore, Hong Kong, LA, SF, New York, London, Middle East, Singapore. Imagine doing that trip mm. <laughs> four times in five weeks. And it's, it's, it's for fundraising. It's grueling. It, it, it is grueling. And, and when I talk about fundraising, this is, this is not IPO roadshow fundraising. This is just private capital fundraising. And it's getting tough. But, but what it is showing to me is that if you have the right business model, with the right metrics, with the right team, you can raise funding. Mm. Uh, but what's also interesting is that investors are getting a lot smarter. And to my point earlier about looking at the data, whereas five years ago, only entrepreneurs knew how to look at the data. Mm. Investors didn't really know how to analyze the data. They would just blindly invest. Now investors are getting smarter and they're looking at the data as well. So you're getting investors, more often than not, looking at the data from an early stage company and, and saying, you know what, I don't think that's going to work unless you pivot your business model. So many startups here mm. in Asia. There was a study that said 16 companies rose to one, more than $1 billion in the last year or so. But having been through the 2000 dot com crash, what would worry you? What would worry me? So What would concern you about the tech bubble if you did see one again? What are some of the signs? Yeah, I, I think, I think what, was, what was fascinating was, you know, you were seeing companies raise millions and millions and millions of dollars without having any revenue. I think what's completely changed today is that the companies actually genuinely have revenue. I think entrepreneurs and investors are getting smart on realizing I need users, but I need volume and I need transactions and I need revenue from those users in some way, shape or form very early on in the process. And then I'll raise money to, to extrapolate that completely. And I think that's exactly what companies are doing today. They, they, you know, they're going to market early on proving that they have revenue Whereas if they can't prove that they have revenue, those are the companies that are having trouble raising subsequent rounds of funding. So we, we get more companies that way, then you would start worrying about a tech bubble? Correct. Don't go away, coming up next. The things I do, you know, with the CEO these days. Okay, here we go. Managing Asia, we'll be right back. Patrick, why do you have this punching bag here? Well, you know... De-stress? Yeah, you know, like if, if you're in a disruptive business, you deal with a lot of people that are very stressful, particularly media journalists. <laughs> so... Okay, you can like punch it. He challenged me to a this. match. The crazy one is okay. to see how high you can kick. Okay, okay, let's do this. Okay, ready? Can you... The things I do, you know, with a CEO these days. <laughs> That's pretty scary. I didn't realize it was going to be left foot. Are you left footed? Uh, no, it just came out of nowhere. Be careful of my left foot. Well, fun's over. Back to business. You're an early disruptor. At the young and tender age of 24, you started to dabble in the online business, got badly burnt in a 2000 dot com crash, made a big comeback, took five companies from startup to IPO. Now your net worth is estimated at 400 million. US dollars. What drives you to succeed all these years? I've realized over the journey that different things motivate you over different paths of your career. So when we first met, um, you know, I just, 
I, I just didn't want a corporate career. I wanted to do my own thing. And you know what? And I wanted. I you just, were a rebel. And I, and I was a rebel. And you know, I wanted to make my parents proud. I wanted, I wanted to make money. I wanted to have a nice car. I wanted to have a nice house. Yeah. And then. And then, and then later on in the journey, you know, once you start to realize that you're comfortable with those things, then you start to think, well, what else really motivates me? And I think for this particular part of my journey, what, what is, you know, as you mentioned before, we know we were very, very fortunate to have a big exit. And, and one of the things that really motivated me after that exit, because I reflected for a while, and it was, no one ever came up to me and said, hey, congrats, you made a lot of money. It was, when people congratulated me, it was like, hey, congratulations, you really proved that, that Southeast Asia is a worthwhile place to build an internet business. And I would hear that feedback from young entrepreneurs and, you know, or people working in companies and going, I don't know whether I should quit my job and become an entrepreneur, but when I read about what happened with iProperty, it, it made me realize that, you know what, I should quit my job and become an entrepreneur. Mm. It felt good. Mm. And, and then I realized that what I really wanted to do in the next chapter as an entrepreneur was that I really wanted to create something that Southeast Asians could be proud for, of. And, you know, when we shared that vision with people like Rupert Murdoch or John Malone, you know, they were, it, it was so refreshing for them to say, hey, you know what? I really think you guys can do it. So it's, it's when I look at what motivates us now, it's, it's, it sounds so simple, but it's just to create something great mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia for the rest of the world. Well, it's been an amazing journey. You're 41 years old. Is that all by internet standards? That, I'm actually really, really old by internet <laughs> standards. Is Patrick Grove always this excitable? Well, you know what it is, Chris? We only live once. And so I feel like this is such a short, finite amount of time to create something great. And so if you're going to create something great, you've got to move as fast as you can every moment of the day. Mm. Don't waste time. Exactly. Mm. What advice would you give other internet entrepreneurs out there on how to be successful, how to create great disruptive businesses? Number one, all the time, just persevere. Just persevere, never give up, just keep pushing. You know, I'm going to admit, when you first interviewed us in 1999, mm. I probably had no idea about 80% of the things that I shared with you, but it was the commitment to learn, the commitment to grow, the commitment to never give up, and we eventually figured things out that we should be doing and, and figured things out that we shouldn't be Any doing. Any mistakes to avoid? Hundreds and hundreds of mistakes. And, and What's the biggest? You know, the biggest mistake is, is inaction. The biggest mistake is not doing everything because you learn from every moment. And, and I, one of the things is that, you know, we're happy to make mistakes. Just learn them really fast mm -hmm. and don't make them again. And, and so I think for every entrepreneur is you know, cherish the setbacks because that's when you make great distinctions on how to tackle that problem differently next time. And when you find something that works, double down, triple down, and just ride it. Okay. So I know now you're very busy with iFlix. What's the next big idea you have in your head that you want to disrupt? And one of the things that we launched in conjunction with uh, Jack Mart, Alibaba, and the Prime Minister of Malaysia is we launched a concept called the Digital Free Trade Zone. It's the world's first digital free trade zone. Uh, it'll be launched in Malaysia, sorry, it was launched in Malaysia. It'll go live in the next several months. And as part of that digital free trade zone, um, Catcher is building something called Kuala Lumpur Internet City, KLIC. So you're Click. investing in this project? So we're the massive developer of building a massive city that is designed from the ground up on day one. We're literally building a smart city from scratch designed for tech companies. So you think about what do we need? We need colleges, we need universities, we need sleeping pods, you know, because programmers like to start work at midnight and then work for 24 hours straight. We're working with the Malaysian government to ease visa permits so that entrepreneurs can move to Malaysia and build and become entrepreneurs from the get-go. So when I start to think about great innovative hubs, I realize that that if the government and private sector could work together and build a dedicated zone or hub or city with all of the great inputs that can help support entrepreneurs, then that would be a great thing. And that's exactly what we're building with Kuala Lumpur Internet City that is part of the digital free trade zone. And that was Patrick Grove, founder of Catcher Group, based here in Kuala Lumpur. Hope you've enjoyed this Managing Asia 20th anniversary special. Do check us online at managingasia.cmbc.com for more exclusive leadership insights. Until next time, I'm Christine Tan. Thanks for watching.